my great pleasure to introduce my coworker, Glenn Raymond, who's tonight's speaker. We've been working together at the City Water Quality Program for uh, three and a half years now. Um, Clint is a person of excellent good cheer and warmth. Uh, he has a charming wit and that really does break up the ongoing <coughs> soul crushing that takes place around our office. Thank you very much for mentioning that, Dennis. Um, he's, a, he's a good person to help with that kind of problem. On a few occasions, Clint's smooth spoken professionalism has bailed our team out of some tight spots when the rest of us were left speechless. Um, Clint is originally from Knoxville. He went to UTK and got a BS in plant science and landscape design. Uh, he also has a master's in landscape architecture. Before coming to work at the city, he was already involved in various planning and design projects around town, including Miller Park, places you've heard of, uh, Sturgey Farm, Master Plan, UTC, Oak and Pine Street Pedestrian Corridors, Walnut Street Plaza, Notre Dame Freedom Structure Retrofit. Um, with our team, he has been working on uh, various projects, the Superfund uh, Grasslands Project, Understory at GM Gardens, which we did a program about um, maybe a year and a half ago. We looked at it on the YouTube channel, actually. Um, Heritage Park and Goodwood Road Tree Canopy Improvements, just to name a few. Um, Clint stays very busy outside work as well. He and his lovely wife, who also works full time, uh, run back and forth to Knoxville a lot. They regularly rebuild major chunks of their house, <laughs> uh, redesign the yard, uh, but they do also make time and grow veggies and go hiking with their two hilarious young daughters. So let's welcome Clint Wayman to the Wild Ones. Largely self-sustaining. 
modular matrix based design provides an approachable method of developing multi layered plantings with an easily understood means of installation for gardens of any size. For the native plant advocate, matrix based plant design allows a homeowner slash designer, one and the same in this case, to experiment with plant community establishment while opening up space for nature to fill in the gaps and answer the questions that you didn't even think to ask. That sounds like a big ask of just one particular design method, and I think that this, uh, this matrix-based planting uh, answers quite effectively. The first thing that I want to add, I want to pull from here, multi-layered system. If you are new to the enthusiasm of native plants, uh, then this may be new to you, but if you are not, if you if you've spoken with Lynn uh, enough times, you are certainly familiar with the idea of a multi-layered system. Nothing in our lives exists in a single layer. This room is not a single layer. I can see one, two, three, four, five. We experience space in multiple layers, and plant communities uh, organize themselves similarly. Uh, this is just one. This is one graphic that is pulled from. Uh, Thomas Renier and Claudia West's book, Planting in a Post-Wild World. It's a fantastic, fantastic read, it's actually very easy to read. And I'll, I'll hit on it a little bit later as well. Uh, but they have broken their, through their methodology down into two, la three layers. There's ground cover layer, your seasonal theme layer, your structural layer. Each layer serves a very necessary and specific purpose uh, and complements the other layers. And we can produce a bit more directly with the light. Yes. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, I was hoping to have like a hotel mic or like a Britney mic around here, but... Uh, so the ground cover layer, right, these are, these are things like your grasses, your sedges, your ground covers, uh, your Pachysandra, your, your verbenas, some of your more prostrate ferns, uh, stuff like that. Seasonal thing layer, obviously, more of your charismatic perennials, and then structural layer, which are moments of excitement, and this graphic is showing shrubs. Uh, and Joe Pie of some sort, or bone set, depending on who you talk to. Uh, but just, uh, just a graphic representation, I guess. The next one is an approachable method. Uh, the graphic you see up here uh, is not overly complicated. This particular method does not require a ton of highly specialized graphic skills, which is something that I really like about it. You know, I love graphics, I love representation. Huge assistance. Huge emphasis on that in grad school, uh, but when it comes to speaking to just someone who doesn't have a background in design, you can understand that each one of those yellow squares represents one thing or one group of things, perhaps, and each uh, magenta dot represents one thing or one group of things. And underlying those individual items is a base layer or that ground cover layer whether it's the uh, pink hatches in the lower right corner or in the upper right corner of the green, kind of hash marks, so on and so forth. This is a method that people, that most people, everyone, I dare say, can understand and approach and appreciate. Easily understood means of installation. This goes back to uh, the upcoming event out at Sturkey Farms. So many people say, oh, I can pot a plant but time and time again, we see in actual installations, uh, plants are spaced incorrectly, plants are located completely across the site, plants are, trees specific, trees most often are dug too deep or they're set up too high. People just don't, I don't know. It, I don't understand how people don't get it, but some people don't get it, right? Uh, this, is, this is a graphic of Murray Gardens uh, in Chicago. This is a, a peat alluf and Woodruff. It is Roy Diblick, and I, actually I knew it was Roy because we're going to talk about him in a second. Um, probably the, and, and after the installation, the Lurie Gardens have hired graphic artists and designers to come back and, not posthumously, but after the fact, map this naturalized garden as it progresses through time. Uh, but again, if, if you look at this graphic, you can see that there are very clear delineations based on color in this particular, in this particular case. Uh, you can see there's a large swath of, of violet to purple through the middle. There's yellows, different shades of yellows. There's individual dots, right? You can understand that whatever plant is, is associated with that graphic or whatever with that symbol goes there, right? That's a, that's a, a known thing that we can find in space. 
allows for the homeowner to experiment. This is Water Lilies by Monet uh, in Roy Dibble's book, uh, The No Maintenance Garden, and we'll get to that in just a little bit. He pulls a lot of, I mean, they're just, he pulls a lot of sample module, like design modules, and he, he pulls them directly from Impressionist paintings. Uh, and and made, well, there's an opportunity to have fun with it. If you are playing the role, if you are the designer, you're not, you're not playing the role of designer, everything is designed. If you are serving as the design lead for your project, for your front landscape bed, for your neighbor's flower pots, for whatever it happens to be, you get to decide. Like you have the authority in that moment to say, this goes here, this goes here. I, I want that to happen, right? Um, and so, you, I mean, to me, that's exciting. It's a little nerve-wracking sometimes when you're when you're field locating plants for a client or for the city. And you're like, does that instrument really need to go there? And it does. Uh, and it does because you say it does in that moment. And that's 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 honestly the best that you can do. Uh, but you can pull you can pull design inspiration from anything, right? I know. Uh, you know I actually pulled out a number of slides here that were uh, some of the patterns that uh, W. Gary Smith talks about. And then in the symposium, he had an entire one-hour lecture on design patterns in nature, and that we see out here. Uh, so I pulled those out. Uh, but anything can become inspiration, and anything can turn into an effective, good design. History and context, matrix-based planting design. Instead of this down to grab a sip of water real quick. So there are three books uh, that I have found extremely helpful. I have two of them here in my backpack uh, if anyone wants to see them afterward. First is The Self-Sustaining Garden by Peter Thompson. Uh, one that I already mentioned, The No Maintenance Perennial Garden by Roy Diblick. And then Planting in a Post-Wild World by Thomas Renier and Claudia West. Can I get a show of hands of people who are, or are, or people who are in some way, shape, or form familiar with any of these books? One, two, six or seven. Awesome. So again, phenomenal resources. I I don't I don't know if the if the um, Chattanooga Library is carrying, but the East Ridge Library does because we live in East Ridge. Uh, so phenomenal reads. May, they they allow easy access to very complex design ideas and principles. The Self Sustaining Garden, written in two thousand seven. He opens a book with, what does your garden grow? I mean, I'll, just, I'll just ask, can I, get a, can I get someone to raise their hand? What does your garden grow? Bugs. Bugs? <laughs> <laughs> Lots of bugs. Birds. Birds? Birds, birds, yeah. Virginia Creeper. Virginia Creeper. Lots of Virginia Creeper going around. I cannot wait until this fall. I have neglected trimming it, so I'm just going to anticipate the beautiful fall foliage of it at this point, and so that we don't have to do any work before then. When asked what does your garden grow, many gardeners would actually reply that gardens just grow plants. And this goes back to the authority or the power of the designer. It depends on the skills and resources of the gardener. Uh, but in the case, or, but the, the argument that Peter Thompson is making is that the better question would, would be to ask what does your garden want to grow? So too often we see, and I'm and certainly guilty of this, right? We want to impose this idea. We want to superimpose our, our ideas onto the landscape. Uh, we start to use, whether they're natives or non-natives plants that could be argued have little to no business being planted where, where we end up planting them, right? You think of, my, my go-to example is the uh, like this very common flowering dogwood that's planted right in the middle of a lawn. Anyone who's seen a flowering dogwood knows that it is never, I shouldn't say never because when you say never it makes you a fool, uh, very rarely will you see it planted in the, middle, in the middle of a lawn. Where would you see a flowering dogwood growing on its own? In the, in, in the middle of the forest. They love to hang out right on that, right on that edge condition between the forest and the field. You go hiking uh, up on Lookout or Signal or in the Smokies, 
And you're walking through there, and in the early spring, you see just clouds, like delicate clouds moving in the understory, and that's your dogwood. But, it, as I guess this would be the case on my property, we have a, a reasonably area cleared out that's lawn, it's, it's a lot of weeds, I know the weeds sometimes, uh, but the perimeter is pretty well wooded, and so a lot of the plants that I find love that edge condition. In my own, in my own lawn, I was thinking about this this afternoon, if I were to ask, if I were to continue asking what wants to grow on my particular property, I have, and this is, you know, I, my wife told me I should mow it all at first, but then we've been able to find a lot of really interesting natives. There's a, a really nice stand of mist flower, or the coniclinum, that's right on the edge. There's a, a very delicate hypericum, or the, the St. John or St. Andrew's cross, uh, that also likes to tuck in just a little bit further. There are uh, two or three sedges that I've been able to identify. There are, or there's a couple of, um, volunteer clumps of spiderwort or triscantia that's popped up in the lawn area. Dogwoods galore, redbuds galore, of course. Also plenty of poison ivy, also plenty of, uh, of Virginia creeper. But had I just gone in, try, you know, this is, we've had the house for about three years, gone in, cleared everything, tabula rasa, I never would have known. I never would have known that, you know, some of these, some of these species might indicate that since the, the, we actually have a pretty decent soil, uh, soil profile. I mean, perhaps I could have got there, like, you know what, maybe the soil actually hasn't been disturbed in about 50 years, 60 years, because that's when the house was built. But I can look to these species to tell me uh, general moisture regimes. I can look at them and tell me general soil profiles. I can understand where the water does and does not settle or cool on the property. And I don't have to dig. I don't have to, I don't have to, Put a shovel in the ground. I don't have to tell my three-year-old, "Hey, I just sharpened that shovel. Don't get close to it." I can just look at the plants and and, and understand that, right? Or, or decipher that, right? It's, it's it's kind of a fun code. But then I can start to elaborate on that, right? I can say, you know what? Maybe a little bit closer to the edge. You know, I already see, I already see the mist flower. I already see the the elephant's foot or the elephant's office happening there. What are some What are some complementary species that could land in that plant community. And I can start to build and generate a larger plant list based on what's already there. Many gardeners, this is a, a quote from the book, many gardeners will feel that empowering plants reduces their own power to control what goes on in their gardens. Media, and he gives a whole list of media outlets, conveys the message that whatever, whatever the way we garden, we should all obey the commandment, thy garden shall be immaculate. And later on in the book, he tells a story of sitting out on the lawn with, at one of his friend's house, and it's a very clean cut manicured lawn, very manicured planting beds. Um, I guess I did story in a second, but he said they were having drinks, and he took the pit of an olive and just flipped it into the landscape. And he looked at me, he said, that olive pit was staring at me. And the only thing that would have been more shameful is if my dog would have left his own present in that man's yard. But it only would have been modestly more shameful, right? Like that, that, was, that was the impression that this homeowner wanted to give. Um, I, once, uh, I, I won't tell the relation because I don't, you know, don't want to bad my people, but a dif difference of opinion. Uh, once worked with a guy who loved space between plants. He and I had argument after argument after argument, and ultimately he was my superior, so the arguments only went so far. Uh, he said, Clint, you are spacing your plants too close. Sometimes you want to see a little air around the plants. Sometimes you just want a nice, clean bed of mulch underneath those plants. <laughs> and I said, it's your name on the drawings, you know, like, I'll do it. And then, once again, made a fool speaking to a client, pretty well-to-do area, and she looked at the plant and she said, I think I'd like to see a little more mulch on these plants. And I, I almost, almost threw it in my mouth when she said that. <laughs> um, but there's this understanding that when we, and the, the words that he used here, when we empower the plants, when we give the plants the opportunity to do what they are going to do, then we have the, op then, then we have the opportunity to just sit back and see what's going to happen, right? Like, Right now, as 
it is crazy how many parallels there are between gardening and having children. <laughs> or anything and having children. It is, it is incredible. Uh, but right now, we're, like, you know, there are two and three, and we can't stop taking our eyes off of them, right? Like, they're going to get into trouble, they're going to go here, they're going to go there. But then, and this is sort of the, the beauty of, of the matrix, the uh, planting method, whenever we set boundaries and allow them to just move within those boundaries, we have the opportunity to sit back and just enjoy them. When we have, whenever we set parameters or pieces of logic within the garden, and we allow the plants to do what they're going to do, to be plants, to be kids, to have fun, to move around where they're going to move around, we're allowed, we give ourselves permission to sit back and just enjoy the garden, to have rest in that garden, which sounds pretty good to me. Major planting is concerned, and you know, he continues on, with successive layers of vegetation, one above the other, through which plants form multi-dimensional communities. Uh, I wanted to put this in here because that is a an idea that carries through each of these books that we're talking about, but also through the method of developing your modular matrix planting design. The next one, the no maintenance garden. Uh, I would I would refer to it as a call to knowledge. Uh, you want to know yourself. You want to know your site. And of course, you want to know your plants. Uh, so he, he starts out, he says, these are some questions that you need to ask yourself. What is your monthly average rainfall? Do you know? Do you have one of those little one inch by one inch gauges sitting out in your garden? Very simple, very simple thing to know. How does water travel through your garden? Our backyard is on approximately, I, I, I guess about a three to one slope, right? So I know that except for in the divots where we had a few trees felled last year, there's no water that's cooling. So I know that anything I put in is gonna prefer well drinks, needs to prefer well drained soils. I don't need, I don't need water loving plants. I don't need wet feet loving plants, right? That's, that's not the correct, that's not the, that's not the right place for the right plant. How do the plants you've chosen move through the earth? Do they spread by rhizome? Do they spread by seed dispersion? I mean, and you can go on and on. When do they germinate? How do they germinate? At what time of year is the most applicable for them to germinate? That's kind of a weird question to ask, but I said it anyway. Uh, these are things that you can have an understanding of knowing. And this is one of the things that Roy, that, that Diblick says over and over again, is that the more you know and you understand your plants, the more freedom you can have with those plants. And then is this compatible with your current soil water conditions? Uh, again, Knowing your site, knowing the plants, fitting the plants to the site, um, so on and so on. And then he asks a little more, a little more personal, a little more, uh, a little more existential question. Right? What does ecology mean to you? Uh, this is not so much an existential question. But what are the morning, afternoon, and evening colors of the sky? Right? Like, what are the emotions that are evoked? How would you like to tie your landscape into those surrounding conditions? What's your favorite bird, insect? How do you define waste or debris? Right? Are you okay? Uh, are you okay cutting down your warm season grasses and using those as mulch in the landscape? Or is that an abomination? <laughs> How do you find beauty in the world? Right? So these are questions that inform the decisions that we make. And of course, these are this is just a handful of questions. There are more larger, more meaningful questions that you could ask. Uh, but it's a, it's, it's a place to start. It's understanding how you understand it's knowing how you understand the world around you and how you approach the world around you. Sorry, I'll bring this up a little bit closer. It is a call to intimacy and engagement with your garden. And then the third book, Planting in a Post-Wild World. Uh, this was from a commentary that I found on it. It, says, reflecting, it reflects upon the taming of the landscape, which eliminated truly wild landscapes from all but the most remote sites. And then directly from the book, you know, this sort of the ponderings of, of Rainier and West. And they go on to say that in this light, the recent rally around native plants bears a bit of irony. The belated rediscovery of the virtues of native plants come at a moment of their definitive decline in the world. Not to be the Debbie Downer and say that all is lost, but it's, it's understanding that we live in a different time. We live in, we live in a different space than those that came before us. Right, and so when we look, and their argument is that when we look to natural spaces, and I might be able to slide, slide next to us, we find a distinct or 
for landscapes moving into the future, we, we, they argue we must move toward a distinct hybrid of ornamental horticulture and ecology. Saying there is no going back, hoping that things go back to the way they were at such and such uh, AD, right? Like, if, if you pick a, a, a date in the past, right, there's, there's no absolute going back, but we have to understand that in our modern context, uh, the impact that we've had, and then the positive impact that we have the potential for in the future. Now, these books are a call to pay attention. You pay attention to your plans, pay attention to your site, pay attention to yourself, pay attention to the, the, the cultural zeitgeist of the moment, uh, and plan accordingly, plan your rights accordingly. So, precedent and representation in matrix based planting design. As I mentioned before, uh, that one sentence of that. Uh, but design is all around you. Everything we do is designed from the outfit that you pick out uh, in the morning to the car you drove here, every bit of that car is designed to the landscapes that we see around us. Uh, there is design in everything that, that our hands touch, right? Uh, so we can look from the modularity standpoint, you can see uh, the glass dome on the top left. The, the photo next to it is actually a plan view or an aerial shot of a seating, a public seating space, right? But you can see these individual components of a modular system put together to create enjoyable human-centered spaces. Uh, the, the photo of the cargo ship of the, um, what are those called? Containers, yeah, shipping containers. Like everyone wants to build a house out of those things these days. <laughs> Right, but like modularity as utility, right? There's there's utility and, and goes back to the sort of the, the thesis statement at the beginning, right? Like there is there is utility and efficiency to be found uh, in an easily accessible or an easily installed landscape, and then patterns of natural dispersion and patterns of natural rep, uh, repetition. Moving into some more of like the representation side of it, these are I put the tag di digital dispersion modeling. And I don't think that these particular I think these images came from uh, it was a course at UNLV of uh, an acquaintance of mine, Phil Zawaris, uh, incredible graphic individual. But uh, so don't don't read too much into the data on these. But understanding that there are what I would call zones of influence and zones of dispersion that we can model, right? This is, uh, when I entered into grad school, it was right on the cusp of, of architecture and then even into landscape architecture, moving toward the route of parametric modeling-based design, right? So using uh, algorithm coding to develop your digital models. Uh, and we can use that, and, or we can, or, right? so in this case, to me, visually, this might also represent uh, seed dispersion in some cases, in some situations. If we go back, there, at the top top right uh, on the screen, the red dots, that was a graphic, I believe that's, that's from Thomas Rainier, of just saying these are some general, there's some general seed, dispers seed dispersion patterns, right? There's an evenly scattered, there's a pocketed or concentrated scattering, or there's just a random scatter, right? And so it depends on dispersion methods, whether it's by bird, or by insect, or by wind, or by water, or by human when it gets stuck to your pant leg, right? Um, so understanding how we pull these similar design languages and these design ideas outside of the landscape and into, and into graphic representation. Uh, this, added, and, and in a built site, zones of effect, of affect and influence. Um, this is a project in, pardon my pronunciation, Kaiser Augst, Switzerland, uh, of the Roche campus. Um, so you can see the, these same principles that are pulled in, you know, for even from W. Gary Smith's uh, lecture on patterns in nature, right? We start to see some of these zones of influence, like the far right, uh, the graphic in the far top right, uh, sort of leads itself, leads us and leads our imaginations in that direction. And then how one type of representation of that is just pulled into, like that's, that's simply the pavement. Uh, if, even if you look at the bottom of the, the photo on the bottom right, you know, it almost feels like there's some elevation change, but it's a completely flush uh, site. So, very, I personally think it's a pretty, pretty cool project, pretty interesting project. Uh, but again, 
understanding that that patterns of nature fall into or become part of our cultural understanding and how it's expressed in our day-to-day -day lives. Process and application. I had a principal landscape architect tell me one time, um, so good friends with the guy, said all good design is in the service of an idea. Right? There are no, just because, design-based decisions. Right? It, or, or even if you say just because, the, just because the, the, the apathy, the not caring, that is your idea. And so when we realize this, we can start to say, okay, well, maybe I have some considerations. Uh, what do I want out of this process? We're here for, you, or you all are sitting here to, to hear about, learn about modular matrix-based planning. So what, what is it that you want out of this methodology for planting design? What do you want out of this site? What are your goals? Right? Are you trying to create a space for... Uh, for individuals, for large groups? Are you trying to create a space specifically for pollinators? Is that, is that your one priority? Is that your top priority? How do these goals influence your species selection? There is a project that I'll, that I'll cover in just a moment is the understory, the, the understory IPM or integrated pest management gardens that, uh, that Lynn, Lucy, and myself have done uh, around the city. Uh, but we had a very specific need and a very specific goal and so that led to a very specific plant palette at what scale are you working again are you working at the speed of the human is this a pedestrian corridor are you working at the speed of the vehicle that's going to that's going to influence the scale of your module uh, specific to this to this talk it's going to it's going to influence the <clears throat> the scale of massings that you want to develop in your module it's going to influence uh, the the species selection, right? Some plants are some plants are, are not going to cut it on the side of a roadway, and some plants thrive in highly compacted, highly uh, highly developed soils that you would find on the side of on the side of a roadway. Are there any limiting factors? Height, light, line of sight, is space tight? I, I cracked myself up when I made that slide. Is space tight? Right, so I'll, I'll, I'll get this in a second, but um, the the garden will cover is over at Main Terrain Park. Right, if, is, every, is everyone familiar with Main Terrain Park? Like four blocks from here, five blocks from here. Right, so there's a specific user, and that is the pedestrian. Right, and it's in a particular setting, which is the urban environment. It's not. It's in a. It has it has particular space limitations. Right. And so these are all factors. And a lot of these are just general design factors. These are not specific to modular-based planting. Uh, so getting into the actual development of your matrix, uh, this is a graphic from Thomas Rainier, uh, where he starts out, right? So I'll go, I'll go back to the, the previous slide. You can see the, the tags in the photos. You have matrix species, cluster species, and structural species, right? And, and there's, there's a spectrum within each of those categories of height and width and texture and form, but again, for the sake of this, uh, we'll, we'll boil it down. So the way he outlines it, and this is, it's something that I really like, uh, is, is an easily followable process, right? That's applicable for a lot of things, not for everything. Um, in, in undergrad, we had to write an essay just for a Shakespearean lit class, and I was running out of time uh, Lynn might tell you that I'm a very, very good, I'm a very efficient procrastinator, very good at it, um, but I didn't know what to do. And so our professor had given us a sample paragraph, right? Like, maybe here's some things you consider, you should consider. So what did I do? I dissected that paragraph and I said, she has two sentences that, that clarify this objective, and she has three sentences that serve this purpose. And I structured my entire essay based on that method, and I got a 98, so out of 100. So I thought that was pretty good. Uh, but this is a similar, a similar concept, right? You start with your matrix species. These are your, this is, this is your ground cover layer. These are, again, these are your grasses, your sedges, some of your prostrate ferns. These are your creepers, your, your, um, your creeping vines, stuff like that, right? Your, your carrots, some of your smaller andropogons, your verbenas. Your aerogrostuses, 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 um, some of your smaller violets, like the birdfoot violets, lovely. 
lovely little species. Uh, and then you can move on to, right, you're, you're building that layer. You're, you're going up to the next layer, your, your cluster species, right? These are things <clears throat> like some of your Rubecchias or your Echinaceas or your Alliums. Um, these, are, these are generally plants that want to just drop their seeds where they are and then colonize that space and hold that space on their own. Then you have your structural species. These are these might be your eupatoriums or some of even maybe maybe what would blend those the cluster and the structural species would be some of your larger asters, right? Like your like whether it's a, a New England aster or the oblong aster um, or something like that, or like I said the bone set or like a rattlesnake master, the oryngium, oryngium or, or something like that. And then in his words, you rinse and repeat, right? And this I mean it's it's. To me, the simplicity is what makes this fun because I can I can now generate an almost infinite number of dependable, approachable, uh, like endlessly interesting planting plans because I'm using that 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 base. And then of course, it's scalable, right? Plug and play. He says repetition creates complexity. And pattern, right? So you can see each one of these individual colors, the, the orange, the green, the, the dark magenta, the blue, each of the symbols overlay on top of one another. And now what you have is a simply built complex system of planting. Uh, these are these are these are images pulled from uh, Roy Diblett's book, The No Maintenance Perennial Garden or The No Maintenance Garden. Um, each one of these, right, the Monet, water lilies, these are plants he pulled. Ses, uh, there's a couple of Cesslarias, Salvias, Amsonias, and that's a, good, that's a really good plant. Uh, that he, he pulls from the, the forms of the brush strokes and the, the colors and the textures that Monet used in his garden, right? And he's, I, like, this is, in my opinion, an extremely interesting and novel way to pair that hybrid horticulture, that hybridization of horticulture and ecology. He does Van Gogh's farms near uh, near Auvers, and then he just calls it substance, strength, and texture. Um, and these these are these are infinitely complex in your species selection, right? There are some <clears throat> there are some models that he presents in this book that are three species, right? And maybe you can find a time and an opportunity to to search out that simplicity, or maybe there's a, a time and place where you want you know the I think these are. 140 square feet, each one of these grades represents uh, one square foot, uh, if I remember correctly. Maybe there's a time where you actually do want 20, 25 different species or collections of species within, within your module. <clears throat> the understory integrated pest management gardens at Main Terrain Park. Uh, that's, that's what these photos are from. That's, that's Lucy in the hat. And then if you really squint, Right behind that large echinacea in the middle, there's our good friend Lynn Rutherford. <laughs> Considerations. What, what, what did we want out of this process? These gardens came about because the city forester at the time, Gene Wilder, uh, he came up to our came up to our desks, uh, came up to our spot in the office, sat on the floor. Uh, he's an older gentleman, so I mean I creep a little bit at this point when I get up off the floor, but he's impressive. Uh, sat down before he said, hey, we're having a uh, lacanium scale issue in our oak species all along the riverfront and then spreading toward the south side of the downtown zone, right? And, like through the central business district and almost to, almost the south side, right? And so he said, okay, well, he had he had reached out to uh, an IPN, an integrated, an IPN contractor, and they said, yeah, we'll bring in... <clears throat> Uh, the really common one is like it's a particular like subspecies of ladybug, and uh, we can bring those ladybugs in, and they'll take care of the scale because they are predatory insects, and maybe that maybe that'll work, right? And it was I, I forget like how many hundreds of thousands of individual insects they would bring in to downtown. Not not that there aren't already hundred thousand insects, but these are a species that we don't know if they would show up, say now nah, we're good, and then get out of here without addressing the issue, or maybe they'd stick around for too long, right? This is a, an, an, unknown, an unknown species that serves a sort of an unknown solution to a known problem. And so I think it might have been Lucy said, well, hey, there's actually a really great predatory wasp 
that loves Lacanian scale, and maybe we can develop a series of planters or a string of planters, a necklace of planting sites around downtown that host that predatory wasp that is it's lovely to look at. It's about yay big. It's got a blue thorax and does its job. We know that we can host it. We know that it goes toward a very specific set of plants, of species, and that can be one, one facet of our approach to solve this problem. And Gene said, okay, well, that, that saved me about $140,000 if, if, you know, if I don't go with this contractor. <clears throat> and so we said, okay, that's our goal. Our goal is to develop a planting scheme and sites strategically located around the city that can host this, uh, I said predators, para, what's, what's the word, Lynn? Parasitic. Parasitic wasp. Yeah. That sounds right. Parasitoid wasp. That's, that's the language for it. <clears throat> Um, and our first site is happens to be happens to be main terrain. How do these goals influence our species selection? Very, uh, very narrow margin of plant species that we know are successful hosts for this wasp. At what scale are we working? We're working. These are 160 to 200 square foot garden spaces in an urban environment. Are there any limiting factors? Right. I may enjoy going up to May Prairie outside of Manchester and seeing a bone set or a, a eutorium or eutrochium that is six and a half feet tall. I think that's a spectacular species. I think it's an incredible host for however many insects, but that, generally speaking, is too tall for the urban environment, for a 200 square foot garden in the middle of the city, right? So we were limited in height. Uh, we knew that there is, there's a, a bike storage structure right there, so we we're limited in sunlight. Lime site, these are right on the edge of um, 13, I guess. <clears throat> right, so we know that, that pedestrian visibility in and out of the park, along the street, along the sidewalks, we have very specific view sheds that we wanna that we want to maintain. And it's space tight because that's just it's fun to keep rhyming. Uh, so we knew we said, okay, well, let's stick to species within this already uh, narrow margin of, of, of our selection that are going to be plus or minus maybe 36 inches, right? We want to have full spectrum from ground cover up to about that height. And so uh, Lucy, who you know, worked, served as a field botanist for a number of years, incredible plant knowledge. What, I mean, I, like, I understand what is and what is not inside my wheelhouse, and the depth of her knowledge is far beyond my wheelhouse, right? So we, so we sat down. <clears throat> She dug through. She dug through as much as much uh, academic research and as many articles as she could find. Developed this plant list, um, and that graphic on the right hand side. That's that's all we did. For this. Like that. That was the extent of graphic representation. Right. There was no uh, flashy imagery. There was no great big PowerPoint presentation. Um, when we were trying to think of how the public would experience this, Lucy developed. Those three vignettes on the right hand side, these are just sketches in her notebook, right? And I, I, don't even, I think she was just sitting at home with her dogs one night and thought, man, this would be a really lovely combination that we could incorporate into this site, right? It's, it's having fun with that, with that design process. And I mean, if anyone wants this, this plant list, I don't know if it's actually on the city's website, the, the, the list itself, um, but I'm sure there's a way I can get it to Dennis and, and, and get it to you all. So. So we started, right? We, I, we said, okay, the main section of this planting area is nine feet by, I think it's 15 or 16 feet in one direction. And there's a, a, a sliver that goes behind the bike storage. And then there's an equally sized portion on the, on the opposite side of, of main terrain. And so we started with our, <coughs> our matrix species, right? We started with Udalua gracilis, Spirobolus heterolepis which is another one of those species that if you have highly compacted soils, right, like if you pay attention to your site, you, you'll, you'll know that it's not going to be in highly compacted disturbed soils, right? So we're understanding our site. <clears throat> Schizocarium, scoparium, or a little blue stem. Uh, and so, uh, just to, to, to give you a quick orientation, I, I should have put a, 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 like a quick aerial or site map on here. <clears throat> the bottom of the screen is the front of the garden. And the back of this, the, the top of the screen where A through O, that would be the back side of that garden. So generally people are not walking back there. So we can start to get away with some slightly taller species. We create a backdrop, right? This just general design principles of layering, visually layering the heights of your plants. Uh, 
Actually, I think I think this I think the Sporobolus we ended up switching out for Nacella. I forget the species on it, but I, I remember that was the genus. Um, but we already had a structure, a design structure in place to where we knew that let's find a comparable plant to fill in the gaps to provide that base that uh, can serve a similar purpose. <clears throat> Cynthia trichum novae anglii, or the New England aster. Um, again, these are larger, more bushier asters. Uh, so can start to they, they occupy space really well, and they actually provide a relatively good host plant for uh, for that parasitoid wasp. Oryngium yuccifolium, one of my favorite species, um, rattlesnake master. It's exciting. It's flashy. It is an incredibly uh, noticeable um, plant in the landscape, but it likes to it likes to push on everyone else, right? So we know that okay, this is a structural plant. Moving into that, sorry, I'll, <clears throat> right? We have we have our matrix, our matrix, then we start to move into some of our cluster species, and then and then into our structural, and then we you know you can you can start to move back and forth between these layers, and then all of these layers were actually developed on separate pieces of trace paper that I could then stack on top of each other, you know, I can say, okay, well, actually, I don't, I don't like that. I can pull out, I can pull out that, that one piece of structural layer planting, and I can slip another piece of trace paper in there. <clears throat> Pignanthemum, tenuifolium, uh, incredibly, incredibly beautiful mountain mint. Solidago speciosa, gets a little bit of height on it, right? So this is one that's up there, that three foot plus range that we might not want to have toward the front of the garden. Right, but we know that that aster is going to start to take space alongside that solidago. It's going to take space. It's going to find its way underneath that solidago and fill in the gaps. We know that the basal growth of that little blue stem is going to hold its own. It's going to start to tuft out and fill in that space uh, extremely well. And the same, and it's the same with the sporobolus tucking it back in there to 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 allow for that. Allow for that space to be occupied. Travis Antia, the spider ward. Um, I mean, just again, a, a, an incredibly, incredibly beautiful, delicate plant. Echinacea tennesseensis. Um, I don't think you can actually go to a native plant event in Tennessee and not mention Echinacea tennesseensis. Um, just a beautiful, delicate, uh, native, East Tennessee native Echinacea. Zizia aria. <clears throat> this was actually one of the first plants. Uh, that Lucy pinpointed as, as an effective host for this parasitoid wasp. But again, all of these plants are chosen with that, um, with that end goal in mind, right? Every, all good design is in the service of an idea, right? So we, we and then, in, oh, here, here, here it is. This is the inception part. Even the ideas are layered, right? So there's the, there's the, the goal and the idea of the parasitoid wasp, and then there's the goal and the idea of filling up the matrix. Right, and we start to we start to overlap those two, pun intended, because you're working in layers. Uh, Pensament digitalis, another another incredible uh, perennial species. So this is this is what the final this is what the final um, matrix looked like, and we were able to take this same matrix and use it for the same module, <clears throat> based on the nine by fifteen matrix, and use that over at uh, Jeff Jefferson Heights Park, right, just just down the street from here. Uh, we were able to engage the community who already has a very active, does anyone here live in Jefferson Heights or nearby? Okay. Very active community garden space that's out there. A lot of community, tra community traffic right around the park. Um, and so we were going to take this, take this, tweak it how we need to, right? Some species may not have been available or may, they may have been too far away to get, to get reasonable access to. <clears throat> but again, we have that foundation to build on. Right, and so it, this, it, right, you you plug and play, you create your grid. It's infinitely scalable, uh, and if you think that's too gritty, then grid E with a D. Then, right, then you can start to shuffle these around, slide it over here, slide it over there with, within each row, uh, however you feel is appropriate. And again, this is this is this is the sketch that I sent to uh, that I sent to Lucy. Right, I did. Um, I mean, out, outside of the. Outside of like the research and thought that went into the placement, the actual time drawing this, maybe maybe a half hour, right? And that's probably that's probably a generous estimate, right? These are not highly flashy graphics, but I know that everywhere. Let's see, can you 
you see my cursor sit up there? Right? I know that everywhere on that one foot grid, I can place that Echinacea tennesseeensis. And we and the, and the way we did this is that we went out and we just took a tape measure and we said, okay, line this tape measure out, drop your plug here, 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 here. Let's move one foot up. Set your tape measure out. One, 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 one. Or in cases like this, like this parabolus here on the lower corner, I think that was a, a 16 to 18 inch spacing. Um, but again, if once you have those layers built, you can say, okay, I know that my sporobulus is played is spaced, let's call it 18 inches. I know that my zizia is spaced 12 inches. I know that my tridescantia is not on a set spacing, but it's planted as shown on the plan. <coughs> so on and so forth. And these, and these are a few photos. This is from uh, maybe about a month ago out at Main Terrain, right? So you can see how um, some of the basal growth in the front, in the front left, in the front right of the corner, uh, starts to take up space with that rattlesnake master in the middle, and that and you can see the triscanty, which is the purple blooms uh, along this edge, and coming up right in the middle of this photo, start to move into and occupy that void space. Uh, whether it's with the, um, I think we ended up using Leonardo um, in the back, uh, it starts to occupy the gaps with, even within the echinacea that tends to come up there. Um, we start to start to fill in the space in a similar way, but with a similar intent to how we view nature. Right? Nature pours a vacuum, and anytime there's a anytime there's a gap, it's going to be filled. And so, if we can build a logic into filling that vacuum, we allow the plants to move around. We create the boundaries. We create the the, the, the defined edges, and we can sit back and say, you know what? <clears throat> Maybe the Maybe the echinacea actually doesn't want to be tucked up right against that zizia. Maybe the zizia <clears throat> finds itself over time migrating over toward uh, maybe migrating over toward what we would view as just the right of the the right of the, the matrix of model. Sorry, someone's taking the photo. Uh, right, and, and to me, like that's 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 where the fun comes in, right? I can set I can set my boundaries, I can set my decision-making elements, and then I have the freedom to move around uh, within there. This is, a, this is a separate project. This is Tacoa Park in East Ridge, uh, just off of Tacoa Avenue. Tacoa Avenue, I think it's where it is. Um, one of the parks administrators came to me and said, hey, we're, we're doing this planting. We're, we're putting in a new sign. Um, can you give us a planting plan? And coming caught off the heels of this garden, I said, yeah, of course I can. You about half a day, and I'll have it to you. <clears throat> and so this is the extent of the graphic, right? A little bit nicer because I was sending it to a different administrative body. Um, but, uh, but, right, we're establishing a grid in there. That's these dash lines are representative of those modules. And then once we're inside the module, once we zoom in, we can see that, okay, there we have here in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, Cuberopolosa, uh, Eurybia, Tibericatus, uh, Mertensia, Virginica, right? These are all more shape level. This is not within that same IPM corridor, so there's, you know, you start to move away from that. But again, knowing the site, knowing generally what the soils are, knowing that knowing the, the light conditions, I can start to develop, to develop that planting, uh, that plant list, right? And since I knew that there was going to be probably individuals who don't do a lot of plant installation. A simple note, all planting spaced at nine inches on center approximately, adjusting the field is necessary, right? Like they don't, they don't have to, and, and, and these are all, I, I should say that these are all species selected because they fall within that nine to 12 inch on center spacing category, right? Like I'm, I know who's gonna be doing the installation, I know that I can make this installation as straightforward and as easy and as approachable, and I'm more likely to get the result that I want out of this. I'm more, I, I know that it's more likely that the city and the taxpayer dollars are going to get the result that they deserve out of this. Dennis mentioned uh, an unending willing, willingness to compromise. As a designer, that's a little bit of an insult, because uh, I never want to compromise. I always want it my way. Uh, but. I understand that there are things that I can compromise on that give the best end result. 
So something that I would like to get you all interested in, I guess, well, we're right at 7 o'clock. Um, I have a whole, I have a stack of these templates printed off. Uh, I thought maybe I would pass them out, we could develop a plan list together and then start to do that, but I think we're, we're about out of time and I'd like to give plenty of time or a good bit of time for questions if you'll have them. Um, but I'll have a stack of these, like this is very template sitting over here, just something easy that you can start to scribble on, have fun with, put trace paper over, uh, or I was going to say throw away, but none of us would do that, you would recycle it. You actually, you would, you would tear it in half and you would use it as scrap paper for taking notes or writing lists on, and then you would recycle it. Uh, but you're welcome to come here after the fact and, and grab one or two of them. So I, I printed out 50 of them, and I think that's probably about how many people we have here right now. Uh, and I don't remember if there it is. I think I just had the image credits after that. Um, but that's, that's sort of the extent of it. It's a very simple concept. Um, really had to dig deep to not just walk in here and say, you have a grid, you pick some plans, you put the plans on the grid, you know, you, get, you pretty much got it figured out. Uh, there is, of course, there's more depth to it than that, but uh, from an approachability standpoint, it really can feel that simple. Uh, but with that, I'll, I'll, I don't know if Dennis has any other comments. I'm happy to, to field any questions, to make up any answers that I don't know, uh, or defer to, to someone else. Yes, sir. Uh, here, here, I here, wanted to ask, what stone group grid would you recommend? And has anyone been to grow satsumas or mangroves in the area? I would say that I do not have um, a ton of experience with citrus other than my grandfather grows satsumas outside of Jacksonville, Florida. Florida. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, maybe, maybe that actually answers your question in, a, in, in an indirect way, um, but that would be a question that I, I would open it up to anybody else in the audience for. And stone fruits, any recommendations? On you, sorry, did you say stone fruits? Yeah. Uh, do they grow here very well, like a plum or a nectarine or? Uh, I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of success with plum, different varieties of peaches. Um, I'm probably, I, I will shut up because that is mostly out of my wheelhouse, uh, and I will just open it up to anyone else to raise their hands and offer guidance or advice. I don't think we have any native stone fruit. Um, it's awful under native to this area, and persimmons. Um, do we have any native stone fruit? Native plum. Very interesting question. <clears throat> Sir. Uh, how do you decide what size of uh, plants to plant? You're talking about plugs. When you do this, do you put in all little plugs or do you put in a few that are more likely to survive? Or how, how do you do it? Because financially, you're looking at about two plants per square foot up there. Right, right. Uh, my my go-to is is plugs. I've had a lot of success with plugs, but also knowing when to plant them and, and what it takes to keep them, or anticipating when to plant them and anticipating what it will take to keep them alive. In the same way that you know you might take a one gallon or a three gallon potted plant and you wouldn't put it in the ground and leave it alone, right? You would you would treat it with tender loving care and you would whisper sweet nothings to it. I do the same to each of the plugs that I plant. Um, but but uh, a, simple, a simple answer is that my go-to is plugs. <clears throat> um, from, from a financial standpoint, the majority of perennials that, that I've seen, there, there, of course there are exceptions, um, tend to fill in, um, I mean maybe a little bit quicker, than some of your larger potted plants. This, this is just personal experience, right? And every, everyone's gonna have different mileage, of course. Um, but, you know, there have been times where uh, one of the engineers came, a very specific example, one of the engineers came to me, she said, hey, Glenn, can you look over, this is shortly after I started the city. I said, she said, hey, can you look over this planting plan? Uh, there's a new set of condos going in, we're trying to, or no, kind of, condos have gone in, the city was doing a, re, a stream bank restoration project. <clears throat> And they had specified, I think it was something like $15,000 worth of three gallon canicum verbatim, right? Or, right? And I said, well, if you go with, you know, those are, if you buy them, you know, they, they, they said three gallons. Well, that's minimum of $15 plant. That's, that's the cheapest you're going to find something in that particular pot. Or you can have the same number of 
uh, plugs at two dollars a plug, and you can save about twelve thousand dollars. And she said she came to me a couple weeks ago. She's like, I'm sorry, but they were already purchased. And I'm like, okay, well that's that's okay. Um, yes, ma'am. So I um, I have started a lot of my own plugs, and based on my my goal was that I didn't want to spend a lot of money, so I had to start the things that I knew I could start. So I have all these plugs of perennials, but now the grasses and the sedges. So can I, after the plugs are in the ground, sow grasses from seed? Backfill, either with seeding or? On top of everything that's already planted from plugs. You're free to do whatever you like. Really. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 of course. I'm absolutely sorry. I'm not being so smart. Don't be so smart. Don't be funny. Yeah, yeah, no, that's what you're doing. Uh, but absolutely, right? Like that's that's another way, you know, companies like Roundstone uh, are, are a phenomenal resource. There are yeah. numerous other seed sources where you could say, uh, let's go back, right? So in this particular case, and honestly, this, I was going, I was looking back through the, the species list on this, and I was like, there are not a whole lot of like really low to the ground species here. Um, but let's say that you identified in your in your planning process that you wanted this area right here just chock full of whatever seeds you might put out there, right? Maybe it's maybe it's uh, sporobolus or yeah, or anthrobogartinarius, something that's gonna easily fill in there, right? And you spend the spend significantly less money on seed knowing that not maybe not all are going to germinate and that they're going to crowd there you know a certain percentage are going to get crowded out uh but you're you're building that insurance policy into it i i don't see any significant issue with that particular process but i also know that if even if i planted plugs of, of a particular species and it seeded itself five feet away and not where i showed where it was where it should have been on the plan that's okay right that's the that's the um, that's that's the unpredictability that to me is exciting in the process. So, so this for you know, just have fun. Right, right. Well, but that's just too much work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Okay. So this was a smaller installation. Uh, we worked along with park staff who have like a gator with a watering tank uh, to do to do irrigation. There is irrigation at the park installed, but maybe, maybe, maybe Lincoln can speak to this. I don't believe we tapped into any of that. It was solely above ground irrigation as needed until until the plants were established. Um, you know, there if, if you're working at larger scale, right? There's a ton of, of drip type irrigation systems that, that would function perfectly well and then <clears throat> the the goal or, or the impetus one maybe one aspect of, of going this direction with natives and specifically with matrix based or multi-layered native planting is that it is self-sustaining that if you don't water for a season or that you don't want to water for a season you know that there are uh, one whether in the best case scenario all the species that you selected are going to be good to go once it's, once established, and if not, you have confidence that a good majority of those species, which can survive or which can thrive in those less than op optimum horticultural industry conditions, will fill in the spaces, and you know as 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 time goes on. So, so how long that's, does a, that's it take, a good question. How long does it take to establish? If you're using plugs. I would say I would say give or take two growing seasons, three growing seasons at, at the most. I mean, of course, uh, you know, like some of some of your more bunching grasses are gonna are gonna start to take up space maybe a little bit quicker. Um, you know, there are <clears throat> there are certain uh, certain species within like pycnanthemums that uh, don't germinate as quickly and might need a couple of seasons of Freeze thaw is not the right term, but of, of, of cold uh, scarification, I guess, is, is the word for it. Um, but it, it, it depends. Generally speaking, I, I estimate about two growing seasons. 
to get reasonable coverage. And, and in the meantime, right, you're, you're planning for that maintenance of saying, okay, well, I have this base of, of warm season grasses built into the module. And so maybe, 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 maybe I have some, maybe I have some flood die off, right? Um, maybe they don't take as quickly, but I can see that there's still plenty of energy and life left in those that I, I'm not going to pull them out and replace them. <clears throat> but they still haven't taken up the space that I want them to. Well, then I go back in late fall, winter, whenever, whenever it is that for which for whatever species, and I cut back those grasses and I use that mulch from the site. Like I use the site to replenish itself, and so I can use that as a weed. Uh, deterrent. I can use that as uh, as its own ground cover that speaks to the language of the plants that are already there. Uh, that's that's a really good question. Thank you. Yes. For an urban setting where you've got something like this, and then there's an adjacent lot where there's like a bunch of noxious weeds like hysteria and mm -hmm. creeping you on this and all kinds of other like nightmarish things. <laughs> um, have you ever found like a Physical barrier that's kind of, you know, there's a fence, but you know, things right. come over the fence and creep under the fence and birds, you know, drop seeds. Um, I'm just trying to figure, I'm trying to everything I can. Usually the physical barrier is like right here and you just don't see it. You just, you just <laughs> try to not see it. Um, Lynn, Lynn might actually be a better, uh, or yeah. someone else, perhaps Lynn, would be a better individual to answer that question. We insist, we insisted <coughs> on some metal edging. Partly to protect the garden from mowers, to help the mowers see the boundary between the turf grass and the garden. But a good mowing crew will weed that edge, they'll beat the soil on the outside of that metal edge, and that metal edge is tough enough to stand up to that. And that will actually keep the rhizomatous creeping turf grass from getting into your garden. To, for the most part. It'll still dive under that metal edging, it'll still get in there. It gives you a, a clear boundary, a, a line to defend, which is helpful, and it does keep out the scoliniferous plant and a, a large amount of the rhizomatous plant. Um, we had to put up a little picket fence around one of our gardens to keep out soccer balls, so not an invasive not an invasive plant, but invasive. Uh, well, and there's plenty of invasive. Yeah. yeah, you can consider people an invasive, <laughs> an, an invasive, yeah, species on some of the gardens as well. Yeah, I, I really like edging. Um, you know, in a home garden, you might not need it. You might, you might feel comfortable just feeding that edge with your weed eater if, if you like. And uh, leading back on the question that was asked up here, right? That. We're wanting to use uh, plants of, of our choosing or plants of our liking to fill in those spaces, like to cover the soil, to provide protection for the soil. It, it provides, uh, you know, it, back for, it provides protection from over transpiration, trans evaporation, transpiration. Um, but it also provides coverage from weed, weed seed germinate or invasive seed germination into that space as well. And anything that just does germinate. That, and I, I wish I would have got a, a better picture, um, but that depth of shade along that bottom layer, is, it's, it's noticeable. Like you can, move, you can move your hand from the top of the garden to the bottom of the garden and notice the difference in temperature because of the shade that's provided from these plants. I'll also say that these gardens, mainstream garden is now in its um, second full season, I guess. Um, so like two and a half years now, mm -hmm. and we already have very few weeds that we're dealing with. So like Clint said, the, the shade, um, we're in the editing mode at this point. We have an abundance of extra plants now, and we're, we're actually just at the point where we're pulling some echinacea out. We're pulling some extra asters out. Um, the weeds that we are getting were either already there, so they're remnant uh, Bermuda grass rhizome that are really hard to get out of there permanently. Yeah, yeah. Or they're windblown annuals that just come in and you know, you're always going to have that a little bit on the edges. Yes. 
Uh, did the boss do what you wanted him to do? Did they actually uh, take care of the mold we, problem? So we are we are seeing very active populations of these wasps, but I think it is it's a multi-year investment to, to to see the fruits paying off. And a lot of the time, and I, I, I wish Lucy is not here. Is she? No. Okay. Um, one of the things one of the things that we talked about earlier on is that you know the the, the presence of, of scale unless you actively go and press on the bark you're not gonna which is, is is part of the which is part of the monitoring process right to know whether or not it's working um, but to go to everyone to know whether or not it's still active and, and alive you would actually go press on the bark and see if it squishes out um, so I think I mean like, again it's still it's a it's a multi-year process. Um, I would anticipate maybe within the next couple of growing seasons to maybe see more of an effort. I know Gene Gene is Gene is retired at this point, uh, but Pete the the I say new city forester has been city forester for two years now. Um, I think that, you know that's I'm, I'm sure that's part of his monitoring schedule as well. You know, you grad students that want to. Doing for us, we're actively searching for involved students that want to take on this project. Yeah, absolutely. It's more than what we can take on on the clock. Any other questions? So you, you after you planned, you did mulch it. There. And let me speak to this. There was a thin layer mulch place. Uh, I don't, did we end up using pine straw? At, at yeah, we, um, I think we used shredded hardwood mulch yeah. the first year. Uh, we wanted a, a denser layer to really, really do that weed suppression for us. We are now using pine straw mulch. So a lighter, fluffier mulch that's, that's probably not casting as deep a shade on the ground. But it's, uh, it looks more natural. I think it kind of suits the landscape better. Awesome. Uh, I'll, thank you all for coming out here. Uh, I asked Lynn how many people are usually here. She's like, I don't know, maybe 30 to 60. <laughs> okay. Um, no, I, I, I really appreciate it. I'll, I'll turn it back over to Dennis. No, we're good. We're good to go. Okay, well. Thanks.